it's, so it's lovely to, to remember everyone, because everyone here has, that's been here for a long time, some of you have been here for many years, isn't it? Um, some people have been here 10 more years, 15 years as part of our community. Um, the reason why we were going to do it this way, I think with me and Patrick remembering just now, is because we were going to video it um, and record it so that, you know, in the future, when we're not around, um, you know, one of the most valuable things that we have is the word of the Lord, what God has said to us. Another really valuable thing that we have is our history in God. Um, and you remember, you see in the Bible, there are times where God's about to do something, and so they remember the things that God has done for them in the past. And as they remember what God has done, it's a way of honoring God, but also it opens that door of faith for God to do, another, to do more amazing things in the future. So we wanted to take a moment uh, just to remember some of the things that the Lord has done and some of the history that's brought us to this place here today. Uh, so, Lord, I just want to pray. Mm. Father, we honour you and we want, it says, let our light so shine that people would see our good works and give glory to our Father in heaven. Mm. As we remember what you've done and how we were part of that, we want to do it in such a way that the honour and the glory goes to you, Father. We, we, we've loved working with you, Daddy, mm. and following you. And even as we share our stories, Lord, let it not be about us, but let it be about you and your goodness and your leadership. Mm. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to put this in the middle so we can both see. Thank you. So maybe rewinding a little bit to before we were doing things, um, Youth with a Mission started, I think it must be 30-something years ago now, in Malawi when Joseph and my Banda and Elizabeth Hofstadter, so Joseph and my Banda were, were Malawians and they'd gone down to South Africa and done training there and then training in other parts of the world. Um, and they came back to Malawi, um, and then Elizabeth Hofstadter, a German lady, she'd been over in Bulawayo. So Bulawayo in Zimbabwe was our, our, like, the original base in the whole of Africa. Um, and so she'd been training there. Um, and Joseph and my uh, banda um, had come as well, and they started ministering here in Malawi. And Elizabeth Hofstadter then went to, to I think, a, a DTS in the Netherlands, um, and where she met Zvanji. I don't know who, who knows, some of you know Zvanji. Um, so she was a, a lovely Dutch lady that's just, I think, just left recently. She's been here, one of our longest serving YWAMers that's been in the country for so long. Um, and then Chris and Karen Childs as well. And so then there was this team of, they came as a frontier missions team, and they started, actually, their first uh, center of ministry was in, in Durandi. Um, and they, they rented little houses in the middle of Indorandi and they started Frontier Missions over there. So the beginnings of Youth with a Mission in Malawi was Frontier Missions. And then Joseph and my Matt Banda were doing like lots of pastors training and, and ministering in churches. And actually Joseph and my Banda then became, they led the Bible school and trained all the pastors for uh, the Living Waters, Waters Church. Church. So all of those pastors were trained under the leadership of Joseph and my Banda. They kind of took that, what they'd learnt in YWAM and really were a huge blessing in the launch of one of our biggest Pentecostal uh, networks here in Malawi. Is it one of the biggest, Patrick? Yeah. Uh, Living Waters is one of the biggest churches in Malawi. Um, and then that partnership between the Apostle and Joseph and Mai. Mm. So then um, they moved from Indorandi to the Hilltop Farm. I don't know what it's called now. It's a still Hilltop. Hilltop Farm. <laughs> They've been trying to change its names and things. <laughs> so it's over there um, just towards Chihuahua. Um, and they, they, they borrowed that uh, building. Um, and they, they started lots of their ministry into Chihuahua. That's why we have so many people from Chihuahua Village have ended up part of our, our community because that's where we uh, spent a lot of time on that hilltop farm. Mm. Um, it then moved to another house, and a couple of different houses, but another one just on the way to Vumwe, but always in that same area. And then Chris and Karen Child, um, they got married. After like 10 years of working together on the team, suddenly they fell in love, suddenly. It was amazing. And uh, then they got married. <laughs> And then a little while later, God called them um, to, to go back to Germany. Um, he was British, she was German. Um, and they left Mike Fred, Raphael Zamaquecha, and Joseph Chikopa was the team of three that were then in charge of Youth with a Mission in Blantyre. 
Um, and at that particular time, then um, Amanda Van Sassen and a team had then launched YWAM in Mizuzu. So there was a two YWAM bases, one up north and one down here in Blantyre. Um, and then there was a little bit of a difficult season for YWAM in the country. Um, the, the, in a, there was a good focus by uh, Chris and Karen Charles. They'd focused on building people, not building buildings. Mm. That had been what God had spoken to them. Build people, not build buildings, which is really true. Um, and that's really, you know, in a thousand years, what will remain is the lives that we've all invested in. Mm. Amen? If we, if we want to build something that's eternal, the eternal thing that we can build is the lives of people. Buildings and structures are not eternal. Yeah. But individual people that we minister to and help to know the Lord and go deep in their relationship with him and become oaks of righteousness, they are the eternal things that will remain in the future. So it's a really good focus. But the one downside for that focus was when there was a season under Mike and those other guys' leadership where there was no foreigners in the country with Youth With A Mission, the, the properties that they were building started increasing the rent and they struggled to rent the buildings. And eventually they ended up with no, as they never bought a property. Um, and so we then lost any buildings and we had a few bits of furniture but no physical properties. And we'd actually been in, Waiwa, in Malawi 25 years but with never buying a property. Um, but we had a great focus on frontier missions, and there was this guy, Joseph Chukopa. God spoke to him about going to the Yao tribe. And so as we were arriving, um, Joseph Chukopa had just shifted across with Zvanji, or started I think, dreaming about shifting across to the Yao tribe, and that's where they'd started that, what's now one and a half thousand house churches that they launched over with Youth with a Mission under frontier missions in the Yao tribe. Um, so then when we arrived, Mike Fred was still around, but there was no YWAM work happening. Um, and we kind of inherited three things from the old YWAM work. There were some amazing people around, um, but at first when we came, we were told we weren't allowed to work with them, which was a little bit difficult, um, because there were, people felt that we should start a new work in the country. Um, but God spoke to us about there being good people in the country, good fruits. The next thing he spoke to us about was that um, there was a knowledge that we needed to be careful to be self-sustainable as foreigners do sometimes leave. And so we felt that although the focus on people had been good, we the, the ministry hadn't been set up to be aware of those seasons where sometimes we have a lot of visitors, sometimes we don't have any visitors. And in those seasons where we don't have visitors, when we have our own properties and some of those things that help us sustain ourselves, that would be important for the new season. And the next thing was, uh, there was a call to education. So when we first arrived, I, one of the things I always do is just say, I know God speaks to me, but I know as YWAM's been here, God will have been speaking to YWAM for many years. So I spoke to Elizabeth Hofstadter, I spoke to Zvanji, I spoke to Mike Fred, I spoke to the, the Childs, and asked them, what's God been saying to you? Um, can we just clip, close that one? What's the Lord been saying to you? Um, and one of the things that they highlighted was God had been saying for many years um, that, I'm just going to pause in my thinking, do you think we could just ask them to do the, the, yeah. the chasing in right next to us, maybe just later? We've just got maybe 40 minutes of them not hitting the building with hammers would be such a blessing. <laughs> where were we up to? Where, where did we got to in our story? Asking for prophecies. Amen? So we spoke to those that had led before, and one of the, the words that all of them said that God had been speaking to them was that we, there was a calling for education in Chihuahua Village that God had spoken for the last 15, 20 years. And so that's something we received. We didn't know what to do about it, but we received it, and we said, hallelujah. God is, has been speaking for a long time about this. Um, now, we'd like to maybe dive into a few words that God spoke to us, um, that brought us here. So the first word that brought me and my family here so was that we were in um, Zimbabwe at the time. So we were doing relief work in Zimbabwe, maybe 15, 16 years ago. Um, 
And in Zimbabwe, there's been a big, big financial crash at the time. So we were doing relief work to the orphanages there in that country, coming in from Mozambique and South Africa. And I had just had a new baby, so a three-month-old, so two-month-old two baby, Benjamin. And we were on the road. We lived in 11 houses in three months with a newborn baby. And after a while, I just, me and Susie couldn't cope anymore. Um, we were just, every kind of week, we were moving to a new house. And then some of the houses, I remember, it, it, it was difficult seasons. Um, and we started to cry out to God and say, God, we can't do this anymore. We've got to have a home for our little baby and for our family that we can move out from that location. And the word that God spoke to, to me and Susie was, I want a house of prayer in Blantyre, so I'm going to give you a house there. Amen. Amen. So that was the simple word. So we came here a little bit selfishly. We were just wanting a home. But God said, I think really what a house of prayer is, is a home for God. Yeah? Because it's a place on earth where people, we are the home of God, aren't we? But when the people of God are in a geographical location and we as a group say we're going to regularly invite God to be with us, that place becomes a place where God is welcomed. And God loves to be welcomed in places on earth. Does that make sense? And so this, we said, we're going to set up a place. We want a place to live and we believe God also wants a place to live in Blantyre, a place where his presence is welcomed day after day, regularly for good bits of time. Amen? Amen. Um, but we didn't want to, we felt we weren't going to do a 24 hour 7 house of prayer that was night and day. We wanted to be serving those in need, you know, reaching out in evangelism while still every day welcoming God's presence and letting there be a, a place on earth where he was welcomed by his people. Um, amen. Amen. Maybe just a little bit of that. Even that, do you know that house of, that little prayer tower over there? When we were building that some years later, we were going to build it as a meeting room. You'll see it as a circular seat around the outside. And we were thought we were going to meet there as for prayer meetings. But as we were building it, we felt God say, there are so many buildings around the earth where everyone talks about me, but nobody talks to me. And so we said, let's build that house of prayer there as a one thing house of prayer. A place where people go to talk to God, not about God. Where they go to engage with God, not tell other people how much they know about him. Amen? And there's something important about actually not just preaching about God, but just spending time engaging with him, talking to him, and personally communicating and worshipping him and asking him to speak. That is so important in really having these places where God's presence. And I was so encouraged to hear someone today to say, they feel his presence the second they walk on this property. Mm. That's what we want, a place of encounter where he's being welcomed. Goods. So, I want a house of prayer in Blantyre, so I'm going to give you a house there. That was one of the things that we felt God brought us here for. Another word that we, that we heard was we asked friends to prophesy. So we felt called here, but you know... When you first get called to do something, you really feel happy about doing it. But a little bit later on, many times the feelings go away, you know, and now you need to know that God said it. Yeah? Now, at the first, you know that God said it because your feelings tell you that God said it. But later on, when it gets difficult, almost every vision we do at some point gets tough. Yeah? And when it gets tough, it doesn't feel good. So you need more than feelings telling you that you're doing what God wants you to do. So we spoke to lots of our friends and we said to them, prophesy. And they said, about what? And we said, it's a secret. We won't tell you. Just listen to God and if you hear anything, tell us. And lots of our friends started sending almost the same words. They started saying, there's going to be a house of prayer in Blantyre. We said, hallelujah, that's what the Lord said to us as well. And then he said, there's going to be a training center for young people. Now we'd wanted to do that. And we kind of felt he said that, but we also felt a bit scared because we didn't really feel equipped to train people. I mean, I dropped out of university. I wasn't, you know, very good at academics. So I felt scared to set up a university training center. Um, and then the other one was that there was going to be power evangelism. We were going to go out and preach the gospel, but in power and in deed and in word. You know, preach in word, do acts of caring and feeding and but also act and power as well so those three things were important we wanted to preach the gospel and demonstrate the kingdom of God in word in deed you know 
acts of mercy, building schools, helping with clinics, feeding the hungry, you know, helping with infrastructure, but then also in power, releasing God's healing, his deliverance, uh, and showing people in, in all three ways. You know, some ministries are focused in one direction. They just preach the, in word. We said we want to do it in word, but also in deed, but also in power. Because people are, you know, people are triune, aren't they? Each of us has three parts. We are physical, and we need physical. You know, God wants to save our bodies and, and transform our homes and give us provision and a place to live. Amen. We're physical, but then we're also emotional beings, and we need that gospel that transforms our soul, our minds, and our emotions, and our will. But then we're also spiritual. Amen. And we need to minister in a spiritual way, bringing people born again and deliverance into their lives. Hallelujah. So, a power evangelism and evangelism in general, and then rural training. One of our focuses was we want to go where nobody else is going. We saw that here in Blantyre, there were lots of people fighting over the Christians here. And we said, well, we're happy just to go to the rural areas where nobody wants to go because there's no tithe. We're happy to go there and preach the gospel there and reach out to people that nobody wants to reach out to because God loves them and God sees them and we see them. Amen. Amen. And then I think for me, this very key relationship, we've talked about Mike Fred and some of the others, but then also Patrick Japando was a very key relationship. When did we start working together? Hmm. So I think... Um Right when Daniel and Suze were coming into the country, uh, with Darito, we were pastoring a church in Bangui. And uh, for nine, ten years. And, uh, and overseeing lots of churches over in Palombo, like a whole group of churches. Yeah, I think we... Mr. Overseer, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Your honor. So, yeah, we, our pastor left Blantyre for Lilongwe, and he, he left us to oversee the churches in the southern region and even uh, some of the Moza Mozambique side. And that then, during that, I think we started feeling alive when we go into the villages than we were feeling when we are pastoring a church in the city. So we started developing a hunger of saying, I think we need to be going out into the villages more. But with the, a focus not only to go for uh, our denomination, I think we felt it would be good when we go out into the village to gather the body of Christ. And um, in that time, I was working with Pete's game. Um, he just passed last year, may his soul rest in peace. Mm. And uh, it came out that Pete's game came from the same church where Dan and Suze were coming from in England. So this moment I was um, translating Pete's game's materials into the local language and go into the villages and train church leaders. So I remember writing Pete saying, I think I'm feeling to go and do a training uh, of missions in South Africa. And um, everything was said. Um, only my wife was not in it. Um, she was hearing Jesus. She was hearing why. Jesus the other way. <laughs> <laughs> she was actually hearing Jesus. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. so I was like, yeah, I want to go to South Africa. My wife was like, ah, I don't feel like it. I don't feel it to work out. And yes, it didn't work out. So, hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, so right there, when I was like, I'll go to South Africa, I'll go to South Africa for training, uh, Pete wrote me saying, Patrick, if you are going for training in South Africa, and uh, if, you, if it's that, that's the only reason, there is a guy that have just came to Malawi to work with youth with a mission. And they will be training missionaries. And uh, I think doing it in Malawi it will be good for you because you can do it with your wife. And then I think he was right because we had two small girls, like three and two, no, three and five, somewhere there. Now, 
the person that was talked uh, Pitts was talking about happened to be Daniel, and they already exchanged my numbers. And I remember this day, Daniel called me, Can Patrick, I am Daniel, I think we have never met. Can we meet a shop right that we can just know each other? And then I was confident to meet, uh, I mean to go meet with someone whom I've never met before. So we met uh, with Daniel. Um, he took me to his house straight away and we had a meeting. Um, asking me, what, what are you doing in the country? What are you doing in the body of Christ? And we chatted, share, uh, sharing what I was doing, and also he shared what they have come to be doing. But I think before, uh, in, in his sharing, he also shared that um, he does outreaches with one of the... Um, churches in Malawi that we are also running an orphanage. And uh, we started changing, exchanging visits, inviting Daniel and Suez to our church, which we were leading, and also them, when they organize an outreach, we were going together. So we started doing outreach together even before uh, we did DTS. We did like two years of outreach together. Yeah. And so then with those outreaches, we would do like three things. We would train pastors. We'd gather a group of 50 to 100 pastors. Mm. And then we would go and show the Jesus film in some of the villages of those pastors and heal the sick. So we saw a real, real during that season, there was a real beautiful outpouring of healing. So we'd seen that in Zimbabwe during the feeding of the hungry there. It suddenly God opened the door of healing. And we saw everyone that was sick was coming, was getting healed. Mm. And so we were doing those three things of, um, the first one was, training pastors, which really was Patrick, was, it was so important, that partnership. I don't think I was really ready to bring training, um, but I was excited to evangelize. Mm. And so I, that partnership was so key between us that also the partnership between the nations and Malawi. Mm. Because actually, as a foreign missionary, unless you've got strong partnerships of people that are willing to serve you, but they also you're willing to serve, and that you know, connection, you don't, you're not, you don't end up being fruitful in a nation. And so then God really, there was a gift that God gave us to be able to partner together. Mm -hmm. um, so we did pastor's training, Jesus film with evangelism, events. and then we took food to orphans that were being cared for by pastors in those areas. Yeah. So we, we brought some support for families that were looking after orphans. So that was our three focuses really at the time, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and we did that for a few years. And then God gave us a word. The word was there was going to be stages of the growth of the ministry that there was going to be three stages. The first stage was that there would be, we would be doing outreach, and there'd be breakthrough on the outreach, breakthrough of training, of empowering churches, and of, of power. And then out of that, out, out of outreach that had breakthrough on it, God would start doing training. But we would train people in what we were doing, not what we wanted to be doing. And so that we could actually do training and then invite people to go and practically do the thing that we're training them in. Are you with me? We talk about evangelism, then we go do evangelism, and people would be saved. We talk about healing and God's power in our lives, and then we go and pray for people and see them healed and lives changed. We talk about helping those in need, and then we go and do it. So that was uh, the order, was do outreach, and then from the outreach would come training, mm -hmm. and then from the training would come going. And the word we had was, going will explode out of the training. But we should need to leave that to him. We need to focus on the outreach, knowing that once the breakthrough came in the outreach, then we would be able to train people. And then from the training, we would then be able to send people out, but from the training. And I think that's still maybe something to consider. Lots of these words that we bring, you know, some of the words that we have are words for then. They're still good to remember what God did. Some of the words are words for now. Yeah. Does that make sense? Um, I, I still feel that there's a question mark, though, for those who are in leadership here, is that sometimes when we want to do a school, it's good to say, we want to do this school, so let's see how we can, in a small way, do... We want to do a community development school? Let's do some community development first. Mm -hmm. We want to do an education school like Chris has been doing. First, we do education in the local area, build some schools, etc., etc. And then there's a huge authority when our training comes out of our doing. Mm -hmm. Because we have to kind of grow muscles and we have to get some breakthrough and, you know, wrestle. You're not just sharing like an idealistic idea of what 
is going to happen. You're sharing the pain of what it's like to work in the sphere that you're called to train people in. Um, so anyway, that's a word that we had then, and we saw that happen. First, the outreach happened, and then the next stage, we had uh, Charles Wilson, Patrick and Delitzo. We were working together. Elliot and Sabina Size. Um, we were, and there was a whole few of us working together, and we realised we were kind of the YWAM missionaries, and all these other guys had not done a DTS, and our desire was that we would be an equal group that we've all done the same things and we would lead equally together, that there wouldn't be like, well, I'm the missionary and you're the, you know, local pastor, but actually we'd all be missionaries together. So we ran the first DTS so that the team of people we were working with could become all YWAMers together and we could become an equal team working as a group. Mm -hmm. um, that was when a few extra people came that we didn't know at the time. Uh, Mike Fred invited Malazani, which, who started the Mancamba base, uh, Pat, uh, Joseph Chikopa sent uh, Ali Kadindi and Steve Ibrahim to come first be gardeners and then do the DTS. Um, and then they, again, Ali and Patso then planted the Zomba base. Um, that's when uh, some of the other guys as well came and joined and were part of that first uh, DTS. Benito and, and others uh, joined. Was you first DTS, Benito? Yes. 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 And then some others joined that first uh, DTS. Um, another word that God gave us at the beginning there, Isaiah 58. You will be a well-watered garden, like a spring whose water never fails. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of the broken walls and restorer of streets with dwellings. So there was, that was the prophecy, the word that God gave us as me and Susie were going to come here. We were going to be, the place we were going was well-watered, good provision, homes, building up houses. And that's one of the things that we've seen as well. Almost every one of our long-term YWAMers has their own house on their own land. Amen. If you haven't got your own house on your own land, we loose that blessing and that yes. anointing over you. Mm. Take it in the name Take of it. Jesus and say, what does it say there? Restorer of streets with dwellings. Mm -hmm. God's called you to have dwellings and gardens mm -hmm. in the spiritual and in the physical. Um, but there was this thing of that actually YWAM had been here for many years and we were coming to build up the broken walls and then that Joel 2 scripture came which was that I will restore the years the locust has eaten. That there'd been a season where the locust had stolen. There'd been a, in Joel it talks about a locust plague and the locust comes and, and eats all the crops and destroys the nation. And then Joel brings this prophecy. He says, if you'll come and seek me and, and, and pray to me and, and, you know, that house of prayer, fast and pray and seek me, I'll take the disaster and I'll make it into a blessing. And I'll build up the broken walls. I'll bring restoration for what the plague had stolen. Mm. And so we were aware that, yes, we were pioneering something new, but we were actually building up something old. And we were bringing YWAM to where it should have been. It had been here 25 years. And in our 10 years, we were going to bring YWAM to where it should have been after 35 years. Does that make sense? Mm. That although it had been there 25 years, there had been a season of breaking down and of the locust stealing. And our job was to build it back up to where it should have been after that amount of time. The other word that we had was that there is going to be fruit here. There's already fruit. There are already fruit trees and you need to look out for the people that have already been being discipled, the good fruit that's already here. That's when Mike Fred came and joined us. Um, and Mike Fred came and he was our maintenance guy. Yeah. Uh, when me and, and, and uh, Patrick were in the office and doing organizational things, Mike said he was happy just to come and do the maintenance. Mm. And then I discovered he used to be the base leader. And you know, I was like, wow, he used to be the base leader. And now he was willing to serve us. Mm and humble himself. And I thought, really, Mike Fred taught me how to serve. He taught me how to serve by serving me in humility, not saying, you know, I used to be the base leader. I'm not going to come in and do maintenance. <laughs> you know, he was happy to humble himself. Yeah. And I started to realize there's fruit here in this nation. Mm. Quality people like Joseph Chikopa, like Ali Kadindi. He'd grown up in the... In the um, the King's Kids work over in Chihuahua. And by the time he joined our DTS, he was already a mighty man, ready. And he ended up leading the, 
the DTS is here with his wife, and then again, launching that base over in Zomba. Mm. Amen. Amen. Do you want to go for the vision of the wheel? Yeah. And then, I think, uh, when we get established, we did our DTS, we get established, we started doing trainings uh, as Wyoming based now. Um, Where were we? We were in this year. Like over then. that way. Over that way. Uh, um, yes, this year here. We, we rented a big mansion from an old politician. <laughs> <laughs> like had marble floors and chandeliers. It was quite a house, that old house. Yeah, yeah, it was a thing. It was like we were a little YWAM camping in this palace. <laughs> yeah. It was funny. Yeah, so I think dreaming about uh, growth. How are we going to grow and seeking God? The Lord gave us a picture of a wheel. And the wheel with ten uh, spokes. And uh, we, all, we all know the wheel. Like the bicycle, bicycle wheel. wheel. Yeah, a, a bicycle wheel with ten spokes. And uh, the interpretation of that was uh, uh, God, yeah, the spokes connected to the hub, right, for them to connect to the wheel. Uh, God has made us as Wyoming Blantyre as that hub, where from us we will bath other 10 locations, and even more than that. So along um, the years, we have seen that coming through, um, I think Daniel is talking about planting Waiwam in Intaja with Elliot and Subena, planting Waiwam Manghamba with the, uh, Patrick Malizana and Patience, uh, planting Waiwam Palombe. Uh, I went with Darizzo and the team uh, to plant that one. Zaleka. Uh, Waiwam Zaleka, Waiwam Two Seeds, uh, two seeds. Uh, Zo Zomba. Oh, um, and then also God was doing it as well. So not all of the, this isn't about us planting them. Yeah. You know, God was planting these 10 and we started to see this wasn't about what we plant, it's what he plants. So then we started to say, we want to work with Joseph Chocopa, we want to mm -hmm. work with Delia. You know, and we started to see, oh, it's 10 around the country and we're all one family yeah. um, together. Whether we plant them or other people plant them, it's God's planting and mm -hmm. we want to be part of it. Yeah. The other word that came there at the same time was God said to me, I was studying community development and in community development, you can, for the same price of buying one cow, you can buy 10 goats. Mm -hmm. But you know, cow farming, often it's quite difficult to keep cows <laughs> because you need, uh, you need like the right medicine and they, they die quite easily without good care. But you know, goats here in Malawi, they're so strong. They'll even eat plastic bags and survive, you know? <laughs> but cows are not the same. And we felt God say, I don't want one big cow of a ministry mm. here in Blantyre. I want 10 goats. And what those goats were, there's something about the goats. Goats are local. Amen? Goats are local. You know, the cows that we have, those black and white cows, they're not from Africa. You know, people love those black and white cows, but they're very difficult to keep in Africa. But you know, the local goats, they're local, they're strong, and actually... They're easy to care for and lead. Really, they lead themselves. You know, they'll run around and eat, you know, and then, you know, that, that one's mine. Maybe I want a string, they come back to you. So we started to see we don't want a cow of a ministry. We want 10 goats that are local, that are strong in the local culture, you know, that are easy to care for and that um, are easy to lead. And we started to see because we were focusing on the rural areas, Lots of the people that were joining us, they hadn't been to university. Some of them hadn't been to secondary school, mm. you know? And running a big base of 100 people takes some managerial skills that you've got to learn in certain schools. But actually, a small, rather than having one base of 100, if we had 10 bases of 10, 5 to 10 people, the small managerial thing is more like a family management. And you know, lots of people have real... They, the education hasn't been as good, but they're really clever. They've got real leadership... But the way they've learned their leadership is with their family. And the family of five to ten people, like a bigger family, you've learned how to manage finances. So we started to realize, oh, okay, this is going to be more rural centers. And one of the things here in Malawi we started to see was most nations, um, all the people have moved to the cities. And there's very few people in the rural areas. But here in Malawi, like 80, 70, 80% of our population is in the rural areas. Mm. 
And so we started to see, we wanted to go where nobody was going and plant bases that were led by Malawians that were more of a Malawian style and were strong, were, you know, were local, were easy to lead by the Malawians that were there and could multiply as well. So this was linking together with this word of the 10 centers, one wheel together. But we also saw there was this hub mm. and the spokes. Yeah. What did you want to talk about? There was kind of us working together. Yeah. So the 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 hubs and this uh, that connects to the I mean the spokes that connects to the hub um, talks about the relationship that we are not uh, gonna scatter and everyone operate on their own and do their own stuff, but we will be unified. There will be moments where we come together and um, seek God together and then get been, uh, released out again and also uh, bring impact into the communities. We felt that, we, you know, in a wheel, where the rubber meets the road is on the edge, not in the hub. Mm -hmm. So we started to say, actually, the biggest impact is going to be in the rural areas, but the Blantar base is needed to help the whole thing keep on moving. And I think we keep on seeing that, is our big impact is in Chihuahua villages, you know, out in Palombi, is out where Robert's doing, you know, and, and, and Manzi and others are doing these, these community developments and wells. There's amazing impact going on out there, but the Blantar base is still needed sometimes to keep things rolling and moving forwards. Um, as we were doing that, we felt God start to say that he wanted the new visions and ministries to be come from vision that he places inside the hearts of Malawians and, and, and in the hearts of Africans. One thing I'd seen, I'd been traveling around and I'd seen lots of foreigners leading ministries trying to give those ministries to Africans to lead, and that transition was not going well from the, the foreigner leading it to the Africans leading it. And I said, God, why isn't this going well? And I felt God say, because the vision is not the African church's vision. It's a foreign vision, and we need to have vision that comes from the heart of my African bride. I felt God said to me, I love my African church, my African bride. And the transformation of Africa will come from the vision that I put inside the heart of my African bride. Now, I'd come to Malawi and to Africa to be an evangelist. And I thought, I'm going to save Africa. And one day God said to me, Daniel, why are you here? And I said, I'm here to preach the gospel. And he said, hasn't the gospel been preached here already? You know, and I said, yes. Some of my family and generations have been part of preaching the gospel in Africa. And I said, yes, they have. So he said to me, why are you here then? I said, oh, okay, maybe not to preach the gospel. And at that point, I felt God said to me, Africa, your ministry, Daniel, Africa needs serving, not saving. And he said, Africa needs serving, not saving. And I'm calling you, me, and my family to be here to serve Africans of vision, Africans of calling, so that they can, that the vision that God's placed in the heart of his African bride can start to multiply and grow. And the solutions for Africa's problems will come from the heart of the African bride. I started to see we did colonialism and it hasn't transformed Africa. You know, we did colonial aidism. Are you with me? Big aid organizations telling Africa how to change. It didn't work. Amen? And I believe how God is going to transform Africa, and I think many of us believe how God is going to transform Africa is by anointing and having even the nation serve African leaders so that the vision that he placed in their hearts, in your hearts, will grow. We also want to call foreigners to come, but to come with that servant heart to say, I don't want to be in charge of the ministry and have a group of Africans serve me and be directed by me, but I want to come and recognize that God has anointed African leaders to lead Africa. He loves his African bride, and as foreigners, we come to come underneath and come alongside. Now, I have vision, but I want to find Africans that also have that vision. And together, I come under them and serve them and humble myself so that Africa can be transformed by the vision in his African bride. And I think this is what I realized as well, is really the success of what we did here was because of this partnership. Patrick was willing to serve me, Ali was willing, but also I learnt the value. There's at some point I realized, I, I made this statement, I don't know how many years in, a few years in, I, a couple of years in, I said, 
Every time I make a decision on my own, it goes wrong. Every time I make a decision with Patrick or with Ali, it goes well. And I said, OK, I still have a part in that decision because we're leading together. But actually, if I make an English decision, and it's not a Malawian decision, are you with me? As well as being in it, and we, we need the nations working together. So I made the agreement, I will not make decisions unless we make the decisions together. Mm. And that's why God gave, blessed me with some amazing leaders to work with, with Mike Fred, with Ali, with Mpatso, you know, with uh, Patrick and others. There was a load of different people we worked together, Charles and Lydia and others, or Charles at the beginning. Amen. Amen. So, around this time, we had a lot of violent break-ins. So we were over at that, that house, and we knew that we were going to be in that, at the beginning, God said we were going to be at that house for three years. But then it was such a comfortable house, we forgot it was only three years, because we were kind of enjoying, <laughs> we rented another house nearby, we said, hey, we like the marble floors, you know, everywhere was marble and chandeliers, you know, we like this place. And so then, because we forgot we were supposed to only be there three years, we started to get shaken. And we, every night, or not every night, but regularly, we had these violent break-ins. Once we had five men with big panga knives in the house attacking us to steal all the DTS money. The DTS had started the day before. And um, we started praying about that. We started crying out to God. And we felt God called us to have a solemn assembly. And so we gathered for a Joel three or Joel two solemn assembly, we started to fast and pray and humble ourselves and rend our hearts. And God revealed sin, hidden sin in our, in our community was the first thing. The next, he healed our relationships with one another. The next thing he did is he raised Malawians and humbled the foreigners. Because all of our foreigners, we all started getting culture shock. You know that this, cult, this local village is attacking us. We came here to love people in Jesus' name and they're attacking us with panga knives. I wanted to go home. I said, I want to go home. And up to then, I think I'd come to save everyone. I'm here, I'm strong, I'm here to be like Jesus to you. You know, and at that point, God humbled me. He humbled the other foreigners in our midst. And Patrick and Mike and Ali and the Zamaquetches, they gathered around us and he, he, he evened the team out. So we weren't the foreigners leading, we were leading together. I needed humbling, but also Patrick and some of the other guys needed raising up so that we were a more equal team. And as we became an equal team, that was a healing of our relationships. The, the ministry got ordered correctly because we couldn't move. Up to then, we'd still not bought any land. 25 years in the country, why I had never owned a property. And so God needed, you know, for, for, for YWAM to take a country... You need the, the locals of that country to be part of that process of God getting the land in the country. It doesn't work for the foreigners to do the work. You need the, the, the team of the internationals and the locals working together. Um, so as we started to pray and humble ourselves, God gave us visions. Well, what kind of things did he say? Do you remember what he said? Yeah, I think um, there was a vision of a black gate. Um, I think in the seeking of the Lord, uh -huh. a, fa a fence, property in the fence with a black gate. Yes. And, also and I a think, swimming pool. And a swimming pool. And also I think <laughs> <laughs> digging, uh, digging deep in the prophecies that we heard um, from people that were there before us, the black gate was there. So we started looking around. I think there was, I think there was also a thick forest. Uh, yeah, trees. On the property, trees. And then a house and an unfinished house. Unfinished house. So we started looking around uh, the city, wherever we heard, oh, there is a property on sale. But when, when actually when I heard that prophecy, people were saying, there's a forest, there's a swimming pool. I'm like, yeah, right. You're just making up something that you want. Are you with me? I bet you think someone else is going to buy this. Hallelujah. Yeah. The other word that God gave us was you can't eat an elephant but if, mm. on your own, but if each of you eats a bit of the elephant, you can eat an elephant together. Mm. Amen? Yeah. So then we gave in, we had these houses over there. There was two, three houses rented over in BCA. We gave in notice at the houses. We said, we're leaving. We had nowhere to go, but we're leaving. And then the DTS, we had a DTS of a lot of students. There was 40 students, over 30 students on site. We said, great, what are we going to do with these students? Let's send them all on outreach. We said, what are we going to do with all the staff? We have nowhere for them to live anymore. Let's send all the staff on outreach. 
So we sent everyone on outreach, and while they were on an outreach, we were like, Lord Jesus, we really need, we really need a place for them all to come back to. <laughs> Hallelujah. But God had said he's going to give us the promised land. The other thing we did, we felt we were supposed to paint and plaster and make the old house beautiful. We spent two and a half thousand dollars fixing somebody else's house till it was better than it was when we bought it. We felt God say, if you can't be faithful with what is somebody else's, how can I give you what is your own? So we fixed their house, and we didn't fix their house, we fixed our house that God had not yet given us. We were faithful with that, pro that uh, politician's house, mm. even though he'd been rather difficult to us. You know, <laughs> we blessed him, and we fixed his house knowing that God was going to give us our own place. Mm. And then Raphael Zamaquecha found this house, mm -hmm. found this property, and we said, God's going to do it. Um, we stepped out in faith, we managed to get some interest-free loans in the UK, um, and then also, also all of us, said that we'd take a bit of it. Someone said, I'm going to give $200. Someone said, I'm going to give $5,000. Some, someone says, I'm going to build the buildings we need. The Zamaquetches said, we're going to not build our, our home. They, they made all the bricks for their house. They said, we're not going to have our own house. We're going to give all of our bricks so that we can build the first building for YWAM. Mm. So you know the bathrooms here and the main, first, the main living area, that was built all with the bricks. Where all those murals are in the main sitting room, all of that is built with the bricks. Of the, of the first house that they've never had of Raphael and, and Esther Zamaquecha. But you know, it was our base. Mm. It wasn't the Azungus buying the base. God had humbled the Azungus and raised up the Malawians and we did it together. together. Amen? Amen? That's the big thing. If you want to change the nations, if you want to take the land, you need to do it together. Mm. The internationals and the locals in humility serving one another. Mm. Um, so, we're landing, we're almost there. We may overrun just by a couple of minutes, but we're getting close to the end of this. Mm. So then we had a vision when we came here. And it's some of the things we've already said. The vision was a self-sustaining prayer and mission base with Malawians at its core within 10 years. Amen? That's what we said we're going to give ourselves to, me and my family, but also that was for us as a mission. Mm. We said a self-sustaining prayer and mission base with Malawians at its core within 10 years. Now, the reason why we said at its core is because we didn't want to just say led by Malawians because we still want, YWAM is international as well as local. So we wanted the internationals, but we knew that Malawians had to be at the core. Now, the, the Azungus could be at the core or in the team, didn't have to be, be. Normally, if you want there to be internationals in your team, you need some internationals in your leadership team. You know, it's good to have the, the nations there because they invite um, and they make space for others to come. We then had a group of values that we looked at. And those values that were important to us were prayer, was the first one. Mm. At the core of everything we were going to do was prayer and intimacy. Each day we'd seek God, we'd hear what he wanted to do, you know, and then we'd go and do it. So prayer was the, the center. Everyone would come and pray and worship together. One hour of intimacy, one hour of intercession every day was the core of what we did. Mm. Um, and everyone did different ministries, but the one thing we did together was pray and worship and seek God together. The next one was passion. We wanted everybody to not do what they should do, but to live from their hearts. The vision that God had put in their hearts, to, to live a life of passion. So we were always asking people, what are you passionate about? What is your vision? What's in your heart? Amen? We want people to live from their hearts. And that's always been a big focus for us. We want passionate YWAMers that are doing what they're called to do, but also serving one another in each other's callings. Mm. The next one was power. Um, so we believe that God's power was present. Now, we felt our YWAM communities, we wanted healing, the Holy Spirit to be present, for there to be the outpouring of the power of God. Amen? Um, as well as the word of God. You know, the two bits together. We want the word, but we also want the power. Some bases are a little bit more word-focused. Are you with me? We want all of that word. Yes, 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 yes. We want biblical studies. We want DBSs, but we also want the power of God. Amen? That's why we love having a DBS leader who also heals the sick Shaker. and casts out cancer and does amazing things. Amen. Mm. Hallelujah. We always want those, the two there. Yeah. You want to do this next one here? Um, the, yeah, we also... Had the I mean, poor, no one go. Uh, I mean, no one goes. Going where nobody goes. Go to where no one goes. Yes, go to the poor communities. Uh, preach, 
at, at places where you cannot expect, I think he mentioned the type, you cannot expect even an offering. Yeah, so that, that was the passion. Go into the villages, reach to the deep ends of Malawi and beyond. And I think our focus was less like that we want to try and grab people from the richest families in Blantyre. Though we don't, we love them as well. You know what I'm saying? Our focus has always been more focusing out on those really because this is one of the most poor nations on earth, mm. isn't it? Malawi is always in the like top five or or sometimes top two or one or ten. You know, it's always up there in the poorest nations on earth. So if we're not focused on the poor, what are we doing in one of the poorest nations on earth? Um, the next one was prophecy, that we always want to make space to hear God's voice, like we were doing this morning. We always want to cultivate that listening. And all of our best strategies have come from hearing God's voice and then putting it into action. And then this next, we've talked about it before, partnership. Partnership between Malawians and internationals serving one another was a really important part there. Now, in the midst of that, we started to have some key strategies. The big one being our training our next one being outreach into rural areas, whether that's community development, evangelism, you know, outreach into rural areas. And then another one that God added to us was this education. That word had been part of YWAM for 20 years. And then Mike Fred had that vision for his village here in Chihuahua. And just as we were, one day we were sitting there with some engineers drawing what we thought maybe we should uh, do some classrooms. And I was like, I don't know how to draw a classroom. What should, shape should a classroom be? And then I looked up and there was Chris Scott walking along. I'm like, Chris, you're a teacher. Come over here, come over here. Tell us what to do. And so Chris is like, oh, this is nice. I'm going to let me join and, and organize this education thing. So one of our miracles that showed us that it was now was the time for the education vision okay, was that yes. God brought people like Chris and people to fundraise and others. Um, and then one of our strategies has always been we hear God's voice in prophecy and then we start to remind God of it every day. We start to talk to God about what he said he wants to do until he does it. Amen? Trying to regularly, sometimes daily, sometimes weekly, but regularly talk to God. This is what you said you wanted to do. You know, you want a school in Chihuahua. I remember we, we did lots of prayer walks around Chihuahua. Every day we'd pray. And then within a year, we had a school there. We're like, wow, we've got a school for 600. Yeah, maybe a year and a half. It took a little while, doesn't it? Mm. Um, and so we started praying every day. Another vision, that we're sitting in a vision here. Mm. Just as we were about to start building the school, um, we wanted to build the school, but we didn't have land yet. We, didn't have, we weren't ready to start investing there. Um, we were praying one day. We were having a prophetic time. We had some guys come that loved the Holy Spirit. And I had a vision during that time. And the vision was, I saw the whole of this base. You know, this base is like long and thin. And I saw it like a giant spear. And the, the, the long base was like the shaft of the spear. But here at the front of the property was like a spearhead. And it was a sharp spearhead that was thrusting out into the community. And all of a sudden, that, thrust, that spearhead going into the community was a building. Now, we'd done designs for the building, but it was always a one-story building. And it was a one-story building like shaped like a cross. But then all of a sudden... I saw the building here, and the building was a two-story building. I hate building two-story buildings because they're so expensive to go up, up high. But we saw a two-story building with, with two-story bits looking into a hall in the middle. And we saw it like a, I saw it like a spearhead, and I, saw, I knew it would be a spearhead into the community. Uh, 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 running ministries that impacted Malawi, that impacted the local community. And then within like three, four days, someone showed up and said, I want to give money for a vision. And we're like, oh, okay, um, well, we're not ready to build the school yet because we're not, there's no land yet, but do you want to help us build the community center? And they said, yes. And so then the first half, the first, the ground floor of this building was built by that first gift that came within just a few days of having that vision. Again, that's how God leads us as a community. We listen to God and then we expect that if God's spoken, then he'll do something to make the vision happen. We haven't got to make the vision happen. You know, God speaks education. He sends Chris, he sends Mike, he sends others. You know, God speaks a community center. Within a few days, he sends people to say, you know, I want to give to that. Somebody else came and said, I'll do all the designs for you for free. People, God, if it's God's plan, God will bring it into being with his own miraculous path. Mm. Um, do you remember that vision? The vision of the key? Yeah. Um, so... There was also another vision that God communicated. I think it was a, 
um, a picture of map of Malawi and uh, with the, the Lake Malawi site. Uh, but the Lake Malawi site, there was a key on it. And um, the word that came was Malawi will be a key to unlock um, nations of Africa and even beyond. So actually what happened, you know, Lake Malawi is almost like a keyhole, isn't it? Are you with me? If you look at Lake Malawi, you can imagine it to be like a keyhole there in the door. Mm. Amen? And so we saw that key going into the Lake Malawi and the, it unlocked and the whole region here swung open like a huge door. And God said, I'm unlocking this region to the world. That's how I'm going to use why I'm in Malawi. But also I'm going to unlock the world to this region. This region. So there's two unlockings that happen there. Malawi and Youth of the Mission in Malawi will unlock this region to the world. We're going to help people from the world to come to this part of Africa and be fruitful. But also, we, Youth of the Mission in Malawi is going to unlock the world for people from this region to go. So that was another vision. It was very key. So I want to bring these visions to you. Lots of people had that vision. It wasn't just one of us. Lots of people saw this key are you with me? And saw the unlocking. Some of you are still waiting to go to the nations. Mm. Amen? Some of you are waiting because you want to go. There's an unlocking. That's a prophecy that we can remind God about. Mm. There was another prophecy that he gave us. Um, and it was to do with, I was, listen, like a, a principle that we had is that we felt that we were really called to be an integrated team, internationals and locals. And we said, wherever we, we can go anywhere in the world, but we will go together as a team. Amen? Mm. So we won't just let the, the foreigners fly in and fly out. If we go to a foreign nation, we'll go together with the Malawians going with the international people. We will be an integrated team in everything that we do. I think that was an important thing to us. I think you have to keep on weighing that, how that applies today. But there's this been this united, we will work together, we will honour each other, mm. we'll do it together. Um, this call to mobilise and train Africans. And then I think God started speaking more about this waves, waves of Malawians going to the nations, but also this word about, God spoke to lots of us saying, I want to raise up, use this base and this ministry to raise up women into leadership and send women to the nations. That's why we often laid hands on the women and we said we want, we want to see that change and that shift happen in this nation. Um, amen. amen. I think this is the words that we have written down here. Um, thank you for letting us remember these words with you. Yeah? Again, I, I really believe that these words are some of our real treasures. Now, some of these words were these 10 bases. These, they were like outreach centers. One of the things we felt at the end of our time here is some of those outreach centers needed to become bases and have their own circle of bases around them that they planted. So we didn't want, we don't want any of these words to become monuments to dance around. Amen? And to worship. They were words that led us somewhere. Hallelujah. Maybe some of them will lead us further. Maybe some of them we just thank God for and say, God, you spoke it, you did it. Yeah? It, it didn't happen because we were clever, because we were, you know, it happened because he's amazing and he brought us together to serve him and work through us together. So maybe some of these words are for the future. Maybe some of these words are just to remember what God did in the past and say, God, you did it before and you can did it again. Mm. Amen? Amen. Uh, from that, oh, there's one bit that I think maybe we, did, we didn't do. When we moved from that base over there and bought this place, um, we felt God say we needed to have a new YWAM trust in the country. And Patrick set that up. He had all the contacts with the government here. And we said, up to that time, there'd been a bit of a fight between the foreigners and the Malawians. And we said, we're going to end any fight between the foreigners and the Malawians. Mm. Sometimes the foreigners like to have like majority in the trust so that, because they don't really trust the Malawians. Yeah? And we said an end to this. We will have a new trust and it will be called Achinyamata Achalinga, which was Youth with the Mission or Youth with the Vision in Chichewa. And we said we will have on that trust, in the constitution of the trust, we will write down, we must have minimum 50% of all the trustees must be Malawian. 
Amen? Because we said, we will trust the Malawians. Because Waiwan Malawi is for Malawians. It's not, you know, foreigners, we come to serve, but Waiwan Malawi is to raise up Malawians. Amen? Amen? And number one, most of our DTSs, thank you for the foreigners that come to our DTSs. Our DTSs are more for Malawians than for foreigners. Amen? And we do that on purpose. Because foreigners can fly to a thousand bases around the world and do a DTS. But for most Malawians, this is the base that you can get to. And we want this to be an amazing... No, actually, no, there's four bases doing DTSs in Malawi. That's shifted over these years. Amen? Amen. Um, so we set up this trust, built on trust, and Patrick got it organized. And then, you know, the, the guy that he was setting up with, the, the person that was doing the, the purchase of this property, we set the trust up in three days. The guy, the Ministry of Justice, sent his driver from Lilongwe with all of our papers so we could register it. Mm. They, they spent years registering the first one. It was like that. Partly because it was a Malawian trust for Malawians. Amen? And then from that day, up to that point, we'd never bought property in Malawi. But from that day on, everything shifted. We bought this base. Soon after, we bought... We, we, we just started buying property. We bought Waiwam and Taja, a few properties, Mankamba, all the ones in Chihuahua village here, the ones over in Palombi, the ones in, all over the country we started buying. We went from no land to having property all over the place. 18 properties that we bought all over the country. It shifted like this. Why? We were obedient to God. And also, we let Youth with a Mission become a Malawian organization. Not an international organization, but a Malawian organization. So I think that was very key for us. And even today, you know, we make sure that we have majority Malawians on our trust because we really, we believe in the Malawian church. We believe God is going to use his beautiful African Malawian bride to bring transformation to the nations. Amen. Amen. So Lord, we want to thank you for all that you've done. Amen. Amen. And Lord, we want to give you all the glory for it. Mm. Even if in the telling of it, we've somehow tried to make it about our cleverness or that we did it. Mm. Lord, none of it was because of us. Yes, Lord. All of it was because of you. It's all for you. It's all through you. Mm. It's all in you. It's all inspired by you. Yes, and Lord. all of the honor and the glory and the praise, we bring it back to you, Father. Yes, we bring Lord. it back to you, Jesus. We bring it back to you, Holy Spirit. Mm. And we say, you are worthy of all the honor and praise. And thank you for all that you've done. And thank you for all that you're going to do. Mm. Sitting in this room, Lord, we know there are people who are going to see bigger miracles mm. than we saw. Bigger mm. provisions, bigger visions, bigger breakthroughs. Because you're leading them and you will empower them and you will work through them. Yes, we Lord. honor you that we got to be part of this breakthrough here in this nation for these years. And we bless you and we thank you that you will continue to lead us forwards generation after generation. Hmm. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good. Thank you guys. Sorry that we overran. Hmm. Um, for me, it was important. I feel I've finished something there. The part of the story that was mine to be part of, I've shared. Now, some of you have your stories, and we'd like to record some of those. So please, just because I didn't share your story, sorry about that. Amen? Amen. But we want to hear your stories, but you guys are still here. I fly out in a few days and I feel sad that I haven't shared my part of the story so that, you know, the, the new ones that come can maybe hear that story and say, God did it before and he can did it again with me. Mm. Amen? Let's just say that. God did it. God did it. God did it before. God did it before. And he will did it again. And he will did it again. You know, in his eyes, it's already did. You know, he looks at the things that he says he's going to did in your life. And he says, it's already did. You know? So you just need to start to step out into things that he's already did. And you'll see that from the beginning of time, he has good works that he's did in your life. Amen. And you just need to step out and did them with him. Amen. 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 Bigger things than we've seen, he's going to do in your lives. Amen. 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 We love you. Thank you for the honor of speaking.